Decoding Pipeline explained in 15 minutes. Let's jump right in. Um, the first thing that you need to know is the stages of the rendering pipeline. And note, all of this information is going to be, I guess, platform ag agnostic and rendering library agnostic, because most of them follow really similar concepts, albeit with slightly different names. Anyway, so as for the rendering stages, um, you start off with vertex data, which is just specified as an array of um, ve vector twos or vector threes, however you want. These vertices are then passed to something called the vertex shader, um, which is basically responsible for transforming the position of each vertice individually. The vertex shader is usually used um, um, in 3D games for uh, taking a model from model space and kind of putting it into the world by using a translation matrix and then cal and then projecting it onto the screen using um, a view and projection matrix. So for 3D rendering, um, what you usually use is something called an MVP matrix, a model view projection matrix. Which, handle, which handles this transformation. Do note, however, that um, the vertex shader can also be used for 2D games and games that don't actually uh, require like these transformations because you don't have to do it with a model view projection matrix. You can basically do any arbitrary transform in the vertex shader. Um, after this, uh, the pr um, these vertices are rasterized into primitives. So when you specify, when you declare these vertices and you tell um, your API to draw them out, you're basically uh, you're basically going to have to choose what type of primitive you want to draw the vertices with. Suppose you choose to draw them as triangles, then in the rasterization phase, um, uh, the library will uh, the rendering library will basically go find all of the pixels that this triangle overlaps and will. I guess, select them for use in further processing. After this comes the, the fragment shader stage. Do note, I have omitted uh, a few of the stages in here, like the geometry shader and the geometry control shader, um, but those are optional phases and they're not really necessary for understanding the graphics pipeline as a whole. Anyway, next you have your fragment shader. This stage is also like, uh, programmable by the user and essentially you can think of it as a, a program that runs per pixel. Uh, for each vertex you can specify um, a lot of like an arbitrary amount of properties that gets passed in for each vertex um, and then what um, your shading API will do is it will uh, linearly interpolate between the vertices in your primitive, and get new values of these uh, val uh, get new values of the constants you passed in for the vertices, and then for each pixel, it'll run the shader based on those interpolated values. The next thing I want to talk about is three D rendering. Three D rendering, um, because for most two uh, D rendering. Uh, games that are rendered in 2D, almost animations that are rendered in 2D, you usually do not need the compute power of a GPU to render uh, like simpler scenes like that. The GPU is much more useful for rendering like complicated 3D scenes where you can really make use of its computational power. So here I'm going to basically explain what uh, I meant by uh, model space, view space, and that whole thing. So usually um, when you're trying to create a game or you're just trying to load in a 3D model for whatever reason, uh, the model is will be like written to disk in some sort of file format. The one I am usually work with is .obj. Um, and these file formats basically boil down to a list of vertices and vertex normals. So for example, if I was trying to render a cube, my obj file will consist of these cubes and these edges here. And it will tell, it will basically specify um, how to render this cube using triangles. So it will have these vertices and it will say, um, it will basically specify which triangles to render. However, this is not too useful because um, like the cube is usually going to be centered at a certain location 
And of course, just because you have the positions of a cube, that doesn't mean you can render it onto the screen. That's why um, like the technique that's been developed to, to render 3D objects is by using like a model view projection matrix. Um, essentially, um, by multiplying each vertice by this matrix, you're able to translate it from model space to view uh, to like screen space. And what that actually looks like is you take your vertex, which might have some arbitrary coordinates, let's say like one, two, and five. So this is a vector. Um, maybe it corresponds to this vertex over here in the cube, right? After that, we multiply by the model matrix, which basically um, results in translating the matrix by a certain distance. And this is especially useful when you don't want to render every single object at the origin of your scene, which, of course, for most games that have like dynamic uh, layouts. Maybe you want to render like a cube here, but then you also want to render this same cube here. Or maybe you want to like move the cube every scene. Right. Suppose the cube was an entity, uh, like an NPC or something. It might want to move around, in which case you're going to need to use your model matrix to help translate the cube to a different location. Next is the view matrix. This basically um, projects out a frustum from the camera. So suppose the camera is here and it's looking out. This basically projects out a frustum from in front of the cam, from in front of like the camera position, and it, what it, what it basically does is it takes all of the objects inside this frustum, and puts them and compresses their z values, which might be like from zero to like a hundred or something. From it, it compresses this these z values from zero to one, and it also um, transforms. Each of the each of the objects uh, by shrinking them if they're further away from the camera, as you would expect. This is again done using some interesting matrix maths, uh, in interesting ma matrix calculations, which I'll touch on in a bit. And finally, you have the projection matrix. The projection matrix is essentially responsible for taking for taking this frustum that we got from the view matrix and defining a near and far plane and then shrinking everything within this distance to between 0 and 1, within the range 0 and 1. This is super useful because uh, when it comes time to render these images um, and you need to perform depth testing, um, it's, it's really easy to handle values between 0 and 1. And this enables you to basically uh, make sure that objects that would be like partially covered or fully covered by other objects uh, kind of get eliminated because then the the z, like the z coordinate of each of the vertices, which is basically this axis here, the z coordinate of each of the vertices, uh, you can just uh, like test to see whether they're near like closer to one or further away from one, and based on that you can uh, pass the correct fragments to the fragment shader. Uh, so that it can like render pixels for the correct object. One more note, um, even though I don't think this is super important, in case you were in case you were considering like getting more acquainted with the math, I did a little bit oversimplify when I said it just multiplies the vertices directly, because in fact what happens when when you're trying to do transforms like this is you actually take your um, vertex with your x y z components. And then you add a w component of one. You basically transform your vertice of a vec three with the data type vec three into a vertice with the data type vec four. And the reason for that is because some of these transformations are nonlinear, which means you need to add an extra rubbish dimension just to make the maths work out. I'm just gonna quickly draw a diagram here to just explain it. Although, do note this does require some knowledge of linear algebra which is probably not necessary for like getting by with computer graphics so 
this is an example of a model matrix we could write uh, to basically translate this ver this vertice uh, by five in each in x, five in y, and five in z. Um, and for people who know linear algebra, this will make sense. If you don't, don't really worry. Um, later on in the series, I'm gonna probably explain uh, like demo some libraries that you can use to just handle most of this maths for you so you don't need to worry about this sort of stuff. Point number three, why does the GPU speed up the rendering in the first place? So when you're working with computer graphics, it's a good idea to understand the performance characteristics of all of the devices you're working on. So I'll just do a quick explanation of how like the GPU is actually constructed. Note that obviously this is very like abstracted and stuff, just to make it easier to grasp. Okay, so the GPU basically consists of a lot of multiple ALUs, arithmetic logic units. So all of these ALU, um, all of these ALUs um, can basically work together to like perform large amounts of computations really really quickly, okay. because the GPU essentially has multiple tiny CPU cores just packed together, right? This also means that the GPU, the GPU needs some onboard memory, and the GPU generally has, I think it's uh, three different levels of memory, um, but we won't really have to get into that until like much, much later. So for now, you can just think about a block of RAM the GPU has access to. It's also worth noting that for older APIs like OpenGL, you don't even have to worry about um, GPU memory because all of that is abstracted for you. Although in like newer APIs like DirectX and Vulkan, I'm pretty sure you need to like more directly specify like how you want to allocate your buffers in memory. But again, that's not completely necessary to know for now. Um, anyway, so what having all of these ALUs actually means um, for us as people who want to render uh, like scenes on GPUs or do computational workloads is that the GPU can process a lot of data at parallel. If you can set up some easy to access structure of data, for example, a contiguous list or something, uh, GPUs, you can, uh, because those are really good for like, cache access and stuff, uh, the GPU can literally just iterate through at blazingly fast speeds and do a small kernel of computation on each of them. Can, can perform a small kernel of computation on each of these objects. Do note that this kind of requires each of our operations to be independent of each other because um, otherwise our operations won't be as paralyzable. So um, I guess a more practical example of this is in the fragment shader or in the vertex shader. You might pass in thousands of vertices at the same time, and the GPU can process those in parallel to go render your mesh. And that's essentially what we want to set up for the GPU. The whole point of using these uh, APIs is to, to be able to create a situation where we can just pass our data to the GPU in one go and just let the GPU just churn through the data without much communication. Do note that the GPU is actually an external device, is an external device to the CPU. I think in some of like, uh, I think even in uh, laptop chips that have like integrated um, GPUs, the communication overhead between the CPU and the GPU is quite expensive. So when the CPU needs to like update some buffers in the GPU, it, it can, it can take quite a bit of time and usually you'll see that with and with like games and stuff that weren't designed to be as optimized um, your GPU will actually be running a lot less uh, will be running at a lot lower than full capacity and that's what like usually causes lag however um, I guess the goal with computer graphics is and the goal with all of these APIs is to be able to use to fully utilize the GPU um, and w whether that means by structuring our data differently or thinking about the programming model in an entirely different way.